Yes, time, time start. <laughs> Hi, all. Um, my name is Kier, and um, today I'll talk about uh, running Rails uh, in, in Kubernetes. I work at a company called uh, Shopify, and for over the uh, past year or so, uh, we've moved hundreds of uh, Rails apps within the company to Kubernetes, as well as um, our, um, our main monolith, uh, which is um, also known as one of the largest and oldest uh, Rails apps in the community. We learned quite a bit about running uh, Rails efficiently uh, in Kubernetes, and I decided to uh, make this talk uh, to share um, some of the things that we learned. So today we'll um, start from uh, getting a quick intro into Kubernetes for those who haven't uh, been exposed to it yet. Um, then, we'll, um, uh, then we'll talk um, wh about what makes Rails um, a bit special uh, in, in running it in uh, orchestrated platforms like Kubernetes. And then I'll share um, some of the things that helped us to, to migrate all these apps. Um, first of all, uh, please raise your hand if you ever played with Kubernetes or a container orchestration. Oh, it's quite a lot. Um, so in 2018, um, um, almost everyone agreed that containers are awesome because they provide this universal interface for any app to run it um, in basically any environment that you want. Um, um, but the, the problem of uh, running and scheduling containers uh, is not, um, um, it is still there. Uh, you need to, to run these containers somewhere. Just as a note, I'm not going to, to talk about containerizing Rails because there, there'll be um, a great talk tomorrow at 3.30. Uh, if you're interested in uh, hearing about uh, containerizing Rails itself, uh, please edit this talk by, by Daniel. And, and I'll talk about um, running it uh, in, in production uh, in orchestrating containers. So um, you have the, the, the container with the app and um, you're going to run it somewhere. Um, in, in the static world where servers are configured with something like, um, like Chef, uh, you would have um, a bigger server that would handle um, more, uh, more fat containers that require more memory and CPU. Uh, you would have a server with a bit less memory and you would decide that you would run uh, some other containers there. So all of that is, um, all that math is done by, by humans and uh, assigned uh, by us. Maybe uh, configured with some scripts, but it's still um, pretty manual. And if we think about this process, there is actually quite, a, uh, quite some resources uh, can be basted. Uh, because there, there would be still some CPUs and used left, uh, some memory uh, left. And um, nothing really stops us. Um, well, the, the desired state would be that um, every, um, every CPU is used uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and uh, all the, the resources are uh, efficiently scheduled um, so that uh, we would achieve the same results, uh, have the same uh, capacity with, with less resources consumed, and save some energy. What Kubernetes solves is uh, efficiently scheduling the, uh, the, the resources on your servers uh, in, the, in a very dynamic way, bean packing the, the containers that you want to run uh, in, the, in the, the very best way. So if we want to um, if we want to uh, define it in just one sentence, it's uh, smart container scheduling for, uh, for better utilization. Um, two things here, it's uh, scheduling um, that I want to emphasize uh, because you no longer have uh, a defined list of, of servers um, that, you, uh, that you bootstrap. It's all, it's all scheduled dynamic. If one server um, crashes or the, the power dies, the same, um, the same unit of work would be rescheduled on, on another machine, and you wouldn't even notice that. Um, the second, uh, about um, utilization, uh, to, to make the, the best use of all the resources that you have, uh, which is especially important um, as, you, as you grow, um, 
because you would have more servers, more unused CPUs, more unused memory left, um, which of course you don't want to just sit there. Um, if um, um, the, the next step, I just wanted to, sh to, uh, to uh, get some shared vocabulary and to, um, to talk about the concepts that Kubernetes brings. First, the very basic concept is a pod. Pod is a, basically a running container, one instance of something. Uh, so if we run one uh, process of Sidekick, it would be uh, just one pod. And obviously, one instance of something is not enough to run uh, a whole app or a service. So we, we come to the next concept uh, called deployment, which is a, a set of pods. Um, a typical app would have um, maybe two deployments, one with uh, web workers and another with uh, job workers. And uh, the, the number of instances in the, in, in the deployment, the number of pods, uh, is very uh, dynamic, it can be adjusted, you can scale it up, you can scale it down, you can even set up auto-scaling. If you uh, ever worked with, um, with Heroku, uh, you, you probably remember the, these concepts of Dynas and uh, the, the Dyn account that you can adjust and scale up. It's the same with uh, the deployment in Kubernetes, which you can scale up and down. This all sounds great, uh, but how do you actually um, tell or describe all these resources? If you use Chef or Capistrano, you probably had um, a Ruby DSL. Um, and as any DSL uh, in, in dynamic language, it comes with uh, good and bad things. Good, it's, uh, it can be very expressive. Uh, you can describe uh, lots of things there. Um, but sometimes uh, it, it comes as a disadvantage too because you can do basically anything that you can done, done, uh, do with Ruby. Um, and sometimes you want um, a DSL to be as, as minimal as um, possible. So Kubernetes uh, leverages uh, YAML files as a way to d describe resources. You would have um, a YAML config of maybe 20, 30 lines of a resource. Uh, this is just an example of, of a config for, for Rails app. Then you would apply that config to a Kubernetes cluster and store uh, that, that same YAML file in the repo, which, uh, um, which I think is a, is a great benefit because it's just a couple configs stored in the same repo, uh, not in another repo with cookbooks or whatever. Um, at least for, uh, for me and some of the people that I know, this came to... Um, to some kind of um, sh a shift in the mindset uh, because we had to move uh, from uh, controlling servers when we deploy uh, code applications and uh, new, new apps. Uh, when, you, when you deployed resources with, with Chef or with Capistrano, it was, at the end, it was just sequentially applying commands by, by SSH and controlling, um, controlling servers. You would always have uh, an output of uh, exact SSH commands and see um, what's going on, see what fails, see what, what commands are stack, and so on. With Kubernetes, it's quite uh, diff uh, different because um, you just take a YAML file and tell Kubernetes to apply it, and then that is the, the desired state, which will be rolled out there in a few seconds or in a minute if you have a really, uh, if you applied a, a very big subset of uh, configuration or resources, it would take maybe more. Uh, but um, you have, uh, at least me, I had to move fro on from this concept of controlling servers, exact machines, to describing configuration. Uh, if we take controlling servers, it would be um, running commands remotely, comparing their, their output. Um, when in contrast, when you describe the configuration, um, you just push it and then pull, it for, uh, pull for it to apply, which comes with the advantage of uh, being abstracted from, from the physical machines, uh, which is great for, for things like self-healing. If one server um, goes down, the same work would be rescheduled uh, somewhere else. While um, 
if it's uh, controlling servers manually, uh, it can be not very prone to failures. Uh, for instance, at Shopify, we have a Capistrano uh, config with more than 100 costs, and eventually, uh, once a couple months, uh, some costs would die, uh, just because it's too many servers. Um, and uh, we had to, uh, this wouldn't self-heal uh, if it was a configuration described with uh, uh, orchestrated containers. And yeah, if we talk about tools uh, and technologies, an uh, example of controlling servers is Capistrano and Chef. And, while, uh, and uh, in contrast, platforms like Kubernetes and Mesos let you describe the configuration, describe the, the desired state, and the platform would, uh, would roll out the state for you. So containers, uh, Kubernetes takes a container and runs it for uh, whatever number of instances that you specified. And it's very easy to run a, a plain container, but Rails uh, eventually is, is a bit more than just um, a process. Many Rails apps uh, work uh, as a monolith with the many things embedded into them uh, that makes them uh, sometimes quite special to run as a simple, simple container. One thing, uh, if you use Heroku, uh, you probably were familiar with the concept of 12-factor app, which is a methodology for, for building software as a service apps uh, that promotes uh, declarative formats, um, that promotes uh, minimizing difference between production and uh, development, um, and uh, apps that follow the 12-factor uh, manifest, they um, are usually easy to scale up and down. Uh, with uh, no significant changes to the architecture. Um, as you have guessed, there's 12 factors, and we'll go through a couple of them that are, um, I think, that can be sometimes be forgotten uh, when we work on Rails apps, uh, but they're nevertheless um, quite important, uh, especially if you want to run uh, the app in Kubernetes successfully. Um, one of them is disposability and termination which in other words is uh, what happens when uh, you want to um, restart or shut down uh, a process. For something like web, uh, web requests, it's as easy as waiting for the request timeout. Um, if, you're, if you know that uh, a request will not take longer than uh, 30 seconds, you stop accepting any new requests, wait for 30 seconds, and then you're safe to shut down the, the worker without losing any live requests. Um, same about background jobs. Um, uh, you have to wait for, for the current jobs to, to terminate, and then you're safe to, um, to shut down the process without losing any, uh, any work that is going on. Uh, however, this might be a bit trickier for, for long-running jobs. This is one of the examples of a very simple job that can become long running. Uh, if you have, in this example, it, it iterates over some records in the database and does a, and calls a method on, on each uh, active record. If you have uh, just a few users, uh, the, this job would complete uh, in within seconds, maybe a minute. But as it grow to a size of um, of us, we have millions of records in a row, and we we've had. Uh, jobs of, uh, that were uh, in a very similar uh, kind of, they were doing similar things as uh, this example, and we, it would take them weeks to, to iterate over, uh, over all records and do something with those records. So how do we shut down these workers? We must keep in mind that workers that are uh, long running, they will be aborted and re -enqueued which in this example would mean that uh, this job can be um, maybe uh, aborted in the middle and then it will be uh, rerun again, which is essentially what, what Satic does. And uh, uh, here we come to the, um, to the concept of idempotency when the, the work that, when the code that uh, is called there should process uh, the same, uh, should not process the extra side effects and be safe to uh, be executed more than once. 
Another aspect of uh, 12 factor apps is the, the concurrency um, that allows uh, your app to scale uh, with the process model. Uh, they have this uh, uh, illustration which uh, shows that uh, you have uh, web workers uh, and some job workers which you can uh, scale up and down. And um, to be able to successfully scale these workers, they should not share any, uh, any kind of uh, resources together. Uh, because if they would uh, all, if they all had a bottleneck of just one shared resource, they would not scale uh, very successfully. Um, talked a bit about um, 12 factors. Um, some things about Rails uh, to know when, when deploying it to Kubernetes. First is uh, assets. When you uh, used something like Capistrano, it would probably run uh, assets precompile on, on every server that you wanted to serve requests from, uh, which was a bit of a waste of resources. If you can precompile uh, pre compile assets only once and then uh, distribute that uh, kind of image on all servers uh, instead of precompiling -com pre uh, them on each server. So uh, the, the efficient way of doing that is to embed uh, assets uh, into, uh, into the container with the app um, so that when the app starts, it already got all the, all the dependencies uh, like, like assets. Another part that can sometimes get a bit messy is uh, database migrations. In the Rails community, we're very much used to migrations as a part of deploy. Uh, maybe as a hook at the end of deploy. You deploy the code and then you apply the migrations right away. This step of the deploy process makes the deploy um, a bit fragile. Because what do you do with the code change if the migration failed? Do you roll, out, if, do you roll back the code uh, or do you keep running it? If you roll that back, you already had the, the new code in production for like 30 seconds or a minute. Um, it might not be very safe to roll it back. So um, we try to avoid migrations as a part of deploy and make, the, make developers to write the code that is compatible with both uh, old and the new schema. Because at the, at the middle of the rollout, you would always have some workers on the old revision and some workers on the new revision. We try to make the, the migrations um, asynchronous, um, which helps developers, which helps to establish this, this contract with developers that the code uh, may run on both versions of the schema. So instead of changing code and applying the migration as uh, the same step, uh, the first step could be uh, add a migration, uh, add, for instance, that adds a column, and only then you would update the code to interact with the new column when you'll be, um, when you'll be um, sure that uh, all the schemas are having the, that new column. Usually, the, these asynchronous migrations, they would be applied uh, in a few minutes after the deploy, uh, which gives us, uh, which we make a bit easier for developers by announcing that in Slack and giving them a notification when their migration is applied. Another part of Rails uh, is uh, secrets, which is, um, um, which, well, I think mo none of the modern apps uh, run um, uh, kind of isolated. Basically, every app now would interact with some kind of third party, party API uh, that can be S3 buckets or um, uh, Facebook API, which and all these third parties and APIs require um, require some tokens, API keys, which uh, Rails has to some has to um, be aware of. One approach is uh, secrets uh, in the environment uh, environment uh, variables, uh, the approach that Heroku promotes. Uh, this is very easy, and uh, but as you grow, you would have uh, hundreds of tokens. Uh, and you probably don't want to run the app with hundreds of uh, 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 n uh, variables that the app is dependent on. You may think about um, putting secrets right into the container with the app, which is not the, the, uh, the uh, 
uh, the most secure <laughs> approach that you can take because anyone who gets the, the container also gets the secrets. Fortunately for us, uh, Rails 5.2 ships with the credentials feature, which, um, which allows you to put encrypted um, secrets, uh, credentials, uh, right into the repo and uh, edit them, and it's fully safe to commit and store them in the repo. All you need to read and change them is the uh, Rails master key. Um, and as a result, you run the, the container with just one environment, environment variable, which is the key to the rest of secrets. To recap, um, following 12 factors uh, helps it easier to run uh, Rails apps in uh, orchestrated environments. Um, and uh, being mindful about uh, worker uh, termination also helps. Migrations as a part of deploy, as a hook after a deploy, um, can be fragile and make the, the, the rollout process uh, uh, not very safe, so uh, synchronous migration, uh, migrations can help solving that. And um, uh, re uh, cr credentials that ship with Rails 5.2 make uh, the process of sharing keys um, a bit easier. At Shopify, uh, we've, had, um, we've had hundreds of apps running in different environments. Some of them were in Heroku, some of them were in AWS, some of them were on, um, on physical hardware uh, managed with, with Chef. And what we wanted for our developers is to um, stop, um, stop being exposed to all that infrastructure and just have a, a platform to run Rails apps somewhere. So we've decided to invest uh, into something like Kubernetes, which would allow us to, uh, to scale uh, to scale containers in the best way, and also to uh, utilize the resources in the um, in the best way. Um, as I said, uh, describing uh, if as I said, if we wanted to uh, uh, the apps to run in Kubernetes, they had to have uh, the the resources specs in YAML, which is pretty easy format, uh, no no more than twenty or thirty uh, lines of code in YAML. But still, we didn't want every developer to, to learn that, um, that YAML declaration. What we did instead is we created a bot uh, that cr um, created a, a PR on GitHub um, based on stuff that you use uh, in production. If, um, if you use Sidekick, it, uh, you would, uh, it would generate you a, a YAML config for um, that unit of work in Kubernetes. And the first item in that uh, PR description would be a checklist um, to, that recommends to, to look if that config um, uh, makes sense for, for this app. If that looks good, just merge and your app is ready to run. The next step is to apply uh, the config to, uh, with the cube control um, CLI tool. And if you ever tried cube control uh, apply, file and then the YAML, it returns immediately because it just lets Kubernetes about, uh, know about the desired state and then it takes the system for uh, so some time to provision all those container containers to find a server that has uh, some CPU available and schedule the work there. And this process, uh, that process is not very, uh, very visible. If you're used to Capistrano, you probably want some kind of uh, progress to monitor to see how many uh, of your servers already run that new container. And uh, if maybe, uh, what's the progress of the rollout and things like that. So we've made uh, a gem uh, called Kubernetes Deploy uh, that provides um, visibility into, in the, into the changes that are applied to the Kubernetes cluster. Um, this is open source project. Uh, it's been adopted by, um, by other uh, companies as well. And um, just like Capistrano, it applies, um, it applies uh, configuration and lets, oh, not working. There was a little um, video preview. And applies, um, applies the config and um, and tracks the progress. So robots helped, 
humans to migrate the apps by generating uh, YAML configs. Developers uh, didn't have to write uh, YAML configs uh, anymore, and Kubernetes deploy brought visibility into the, rel the rollout progress. Overall, I think the, the steps that Rails have been taking towards, um, towards running in cloud and running in um, container environments, um, just like Heroku, um, th these steps were in, in the very right direction that helps, uh, that helps us now to run uh, Rails in, in Kubernetes. Uh, this is a lot thanks to Heroku that has been pushing Rails into, into that uh, direction um, to, to make that run smoothly uh, in containers. For us um, and for many other companies, uh, Kubernetes helps to schedule the work efficiently, save resources, and to stop caring about on, on which server uh, some container has to run. At the end, it's not magic. It's just uh, a technology that helps to, to schedule the work. There are some, some things that you have to know about Rails and running it uh, in orchestrated platforms uh, to, uh, to make it run smoothly. Before, it took me hours to set up a new app in production uh, with Chef and Capistrano. I had to find uh, um, an instance, provision it, write some cookbooks, or um, do something else to, to set up all the, um, all the environment, all the packets that were needed there uh, to run uh, Rails. Now, with orchestrated containers, it's a matter of just a couple YAMLs. Um, I th it's, it becomes, I think it becomes very standardized uh, in terms of being, getting started with any app. Uh, you can, if, if the app is using Kubernetes, you can just read through um, the, the resource uh, specs and see how the deployment is organized. Which reminds me what uh, Rails did uh, more than 10 years ago. Because before, every app has used their own uh, has their own structure, and uh, it took you some time to understand how that works. Now you can get started with any Rails app um, within hours, uh, just because you know that all controllers are in app slash uh, uh, controllers, and config routes has all the routes that the app has. So uh, Kubernetes brings this, um, this abstraction um, it collapses this, this complexity, so the, what, uh, what David uh, DHH uh, talked uh, in the keynote this morning. Um, um, you would maybe have a question when it's worth, um, when it's worth starting, uh, uh, getting started with, uh, uh, with Kubernetes, get moving on to, uh, to orchestrated environments. I would say um, that if you want to stop caring about physical machines where something runs, if you want just a, a platform to, to run a container, um, that's, that's a good solution. Um, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, if, this, uh, um, if working on uh, things that I mentioned in this talk from, from Rails uh, to the infrastructure like Kubernetes sounds exciting, uh, please uh, hit me up. And thank you for coming to the talk. So the question is, what's the easiest way to, to organize asynchronous migrations? Um, one way is to uh, just uh, add some checks on for like pull requests so that developers ship pull requests separately. Let's just ship one PR with the migration and another PR with the code change. Uh, because that also makes it easier to revert something if you really want to revert. And which also makes it easier to revert code and not revert the migration because you wouldn't really want to revert the migration. Um, and yeah, that's, that's a, does that answer the question? Well, I was, I was thinking about how you actually you know, run the, the migration. Yes, yeah, how we run it. Um, we have a recurring uh, job. Uh, that runs every five, 10 minutes, uh, that checks for uh, any pending migrations and applies them. Uh, and that works through a, a background job. I have a blog post about that. Um, if you find, uh, just, it, it's on, uh, in my Twitter.
how do we deal with stateful resources? Um, we don't run um, uh, things like MySQL in Kubernetes yet. Um, with uh, things like Redis, I know it's been a bit uh, painful because, um, I don't know, um, Google Cloud or any other provider would diagnose that the, the server isn't healthy. It would reschedule Redis to another uh, node and it would be down for that 30 seconds while it's being rescheduled. Um, so um, it's something that we're actively looking in. Like, I would say that that is not as smooth yet, but for state, uh, stateless things, uh, it's, um, um, well, it's getting better. <laughs> um, so the question is, do we use Kubernetes secrets for, to store, uh, uh, to store uh, credentials? Um, Yes, we do, and that uh, Rails master key that I uh, had a slide with, uh, you can put that into Kubernetes secrets, uh, and it, it just works very, very smoothly. You just mount it. I was uh, like surprised that it just worked. How do we manage, so the question is how do we manage conf configuration for different environments? By environments, you mean like staging and production? Uh, we don't have a, like classic staging. It's, uh, we use feature flags. And, uh, but something like Canary Deploys would be interested to, to look in. Thank you all so much for coming.